The Pilgrim's Progress, Part One, Chapter One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part One, Chapter One. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den, and laid me down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place, with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. I looked, and saw him open the book and read therein, and as he read, he wept and trembled, and not being able longer to contain, he brake out with a lamentable cry, saying, What shall I do? In this plight, therefore, he went home, and restrained himself as long as he could, that his wife and children should not perceive his distress. But he could not be silent long, because that his trouble increased. Wherefore, at length, he brake his mind to his wife and children, and thus he began to talk to them. O oh, my dear wife, said he, and you, my sweet children, I, your dear friend, am in myself undone by reason of a burden that lieth hard upon me. Moreover, I am told to a certainty that this our city will be burned with fire from heaven, in which fearful overthrow both myself, with thee, my wife, and you, my sweet babes, shall miserably come to ruin, except some way of escape can be found whereby we may be delivered. At this all his family were sore amazed, not for that they believed that what he had said to them was true, but because they thought some frenzy or madness had got into his head. Therefore, it drawing towards night, and they hoping that sleep might settle his brain, with all haste they got him to bed. But the night was as troublesome to him as the day, wherefore, instead of sleeping, he spent it in sighs and tears. So when the morning was come, they would know how he did. He told them, worse and worse. He also set to talking to them again but they began to be hardened. They also thought to drive away his madness by harsh and surly treatment of him. Sometimes they would ridicule, sometimes they would chide, and sometimes they would quite neglect him. Wherefore he began to retire himself to his chamber, to pray for and pity them, and also to sorrow over his own misery. He would also walk solitary in the fields, sometimes reading and sometimes praying, and thus for some days he spent his time. Now I saw upon a time, when he was walking in the fields, that he was, as he was wont, reading in his book, and greatly distressed in his mind, and as he read, he burst out as he had done before, crying, What shall I do to be saved? I saw also that he looked this way and that way, as if he would run. Yet he stood still because, as I perceived, he could not tell which way to go. I looked then, and saw a man named Evangelist coming to him, who asked, Wherefore dost thou cry? He answered, Sir, I read in the book in my hand that I am condemned to die, and after that to come to judgment, and I find that I am not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Then said Evangelist, why not willing to die, since this life is troubled with so many evils? The man answered, Because I fear that this burden that is upon my back will sink me lower than the grave, and I shall fall into Tophet. And, sir, if I be not fit to go to prison, I am not fit to go to judgment, and from thence to death, and the thoughts of these things make me cry. Then said Evangelist, If this be thy condition, why standest thou still? He answered, Because I know not whither to go. Then he gave him a parchment roll, and there was written within, Flee from the wrath to come. The man, therefore, read it, and looking upon Evangelist very carefully, said, Whither must I fly? Then said Evangelist, pointing with his finger over a very wide field, Do you see yonder wicked gate? The man said, No. Then said the other, Do you see yonder shining light? He said, I think I do. Then said Evangelist, 
keep that light in your eye, and go up directly thereto, so shalt thou see the gate, at which, when thou knockest, it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door, when his wife and children, perceiving it, began to cry after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on, crying, Life, life, eternal life! So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. The neighbors also came out to see him run, and as he ran, some mocked, others threatened, and some cried after him to return. And among those that did so, there were two that resolved to fetch him back by force. The name of one was obstinate, and the name of the other pliable. Now by this time the man was got a good distance from them, but, however, they were resolved to pursue him, which they did, and in a little time they overtook him. Then said the man, Neighbours, wherefore are ye come? They said, To persuade you to go back with us. But he said, That can by no means be. You dwell, said he, in the city of destruction, the place also where I was born, I see it to be so, and dying there sooner or later you will sink lower than the grave, into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Be content, good neighbours, and go along with me. What? said Obstinate. And leave our friends and comforts behind us? Yes, said Christian, for that was his name. Because that all which you forsake is not worthy to be compared with a little of that I am seeking to enjoy. And if you would go along with me and hold it, you shall fare as I myself, for there where I go there is enough and to spare. Come away and prove my words. What are these things you seek, since you leave all the world to find them? I seek a place that can never be destroyed, one that is pure and that fadeth not away, and it is laid up in heaven and safe there to be given at the time appointed to them that seek it with all their heart. Read it so, if you will, in my book. <laughs> said obstinate away with your book will you go back with us or no no not i said the other because i have put my hand to the plough come then neighbour pliable let us turn again and go home without him there is a company of these crazy-headed fools that when they take a fancy by the end are wiser in their own eyes than seven men that can render a reason then said Pliable, Don't revile. If what the good Christian says is true, the things he looks after are better than ours. My heart inclines to go with my neighbour. What? More fools still? Be ruled by me, and go back. Who knows whither such a brain-sick fellow will lead you? Go back, go back, and be wise. Nay, but do thou come with thy neighbour pliable. There are such things to be had which I spoke of, and many more glories besides. If you believe not me, read here in this book, and for the truth of what is told therein, behold, all is made by the blood of him that made it. Well, neighbour obstinate, said pliable, I begin to come to a point. I intend to go along with this good man, and to cast in my lot with him. But, my good companion, do you know the way to this desired place? I am directed by a man whose name is Evangelist to speed me to a little gate that is before us, where we shall receive directions about the way. Come then, good neighbour, let us be going. Then they went both together. And I will go back to my place, said Obstinate. I will be no companion to such misled, fantastical fellows. Now I saw in my dream that when Obstinate was gone back, Christian and Pliable were talking over the plain, and thus they began. Come, neighbour Pliable, how do you do? I am glad you are persuaded to go along with me. Had even Obstinate himself but felt what I have felt of the powers and terrors of what is yet unseen, he would not thus lightly have given us the back. Come, neighbour Christian, since there are none but us to hear, tell me now further what the things are and how to be enjoyed with we are going. I can better understand them with my mind than speak of them with my tongue, but yet, since you are desirous to know, I will read of them in my book. And do you think the words of your book are certainly true? Yes, verily, for it was made by him that cannot lie. Well said. What things are they? 
there is an endless kingdom to be enjoyed and everlasting life to be given us that we may live in that kingdom for ever well said and what else there are crowns of glory to be given us and garments that will make us shine like the sun in the sky this is very pleasant and what else there shall be no more crying nor sorrow for he that is owner of the place will wipe all tears from our eyes what company shall we have there there we shall be with seraphims and cherubims creatures that shall dazzle your eyes to look on them there also you shall meet with thousands and ten thousands that have gone before us to that place none of them are hurtful but all loving and holy every one walking in the sight of god and standing in his presence with acceptance for ever in a word there we shall see the elders with their golden crowns there we shall see the holy women with their golden harps there we shall see men that by the world were cut into pieces burnt in flames eaten of beasts drowned in the seas for the love they bear to the lord of the place all well and clothed with everlasting life as with a garment the hearing of this is enough to delight one's heart are these things to be enjoyed how shall we get to be sharers thereof the lord the governor of the country hath written that in this book the substance of which is if we be truly willing to have it he will bestow it upon us freely well my good companion glad am i to hear of these things come on let us mend our pace i cannot go so fast as i would by reason of this burden that is on my back now i saw in my dream that just as they had ended this talk they drew nigh to a very miry slough or swamp that was in the midst of the plain and they being heedless did both fall suddenly into the bog the name of the slough was despond here therefore they wallowed for a time being grievously bedaubed with dirt and christian because of the burden that was on his back began to sink into the mire then said pliable ah never christian where are you now truly said christian i do not know at this pliable began to be offended and angrily said to his fellow is this the happiness you have told me all this while of if we have such ill speed at our first setting out what may we expect between this and our journey's end may i get out again with my life you shall possess the brave country alone for me and with that he gave a desperate struggle or two and got out of the mire on that side of the swamp which was next to his own house so away he went and christian saw him no more wherefore christian was left to tumble in the slough of despond alone but still he tried to struggle to that side of the slough which was farthest from his own house and next to the wicket gate the which he did but could not get out because of the burden that was upon his back but i beheld in my dream that a man came to him whose name was help and asked him what he did there sir said christian i was bid to go this way by a man called evangelist who directed me also to yonder gate that i might escape the wrath to come and as i was going there i fell in here but why did you not look for the steps fear followed me so hard that i fled the next way and fell in then said he give me thine hand so he gave him his hand and he drew him out and set him upon solid ground and bade him go on his way then i stepped to him that plucked him out and said sir wherefore since over this place is the way from the city of destruction to yonder gate is it that this place is not mended that poor travellers might go thither with more safety and he said unto me this miry slough is such a place as cannot be mended it is the hollow whither the scum and filth that go with the feeling of sin do continually run and therefore it is called the slough of despond for still, as the sinner is awakened by his lost condition, there arise in his soul many fears and doubts and discouraging alarms, which all of them get together and settle in this place. And this is the reason of the badness of the ground. It is not the pleasure of the king that this place should remain so bad. His labourers also have, by the direction of his majesty's surveyors, been for about these sixteen hundred years employed about this patch of ground if perhaps it might have been mended yea and to my knowledge said he here have been swallowed up at least twenty thousand cartloads yea millions of wholesome teachings that have at all seasons 
been brought from all places of the king's dominions. And they that can tell, say they are the best materials to make good ground of the place. If so be it, might have been mended, but it is the slough of despond still, and so will be, when they have done what they can. True there are, by the direction of the lawgiver, certain good and substantial steps, placed even through the very midst of this slough, but at such time as this place doth much spew out its filth, as it doth against change of weather, these steps are hardly seen, or, if there be, men, through the dizziness of their heads, step aside, and then they are bemired to purpose, notwithstanding the steps be there. But the ground is good when they are got in at the gate. Now I saw in my dream that by this time Pliable was got home to his house, so his neighbours came to visit him, and some of them called him wise man for coming back, and some called him a fool for risking himself with Christian. Others again did mock at his cowardliness, saying, Surely, since you began to venture, I would not have been so base as to have given out for a few difficulties. So Pliable sat sneaking among them, but at last he got more confidence, and then they all turned their tails and began to abuse poor Christian behind his back. And thus much concerning Pliable. Now, as Christian was walking solitary by himself, he espied one afar off come crossing over the field to meet him, and their hap was to meet just as they were crossing the way of each other. The gentleman's name that met him was Mr. Worldly Wiseman. He dwelt in the town of Carnal Policy, a very great town, and also hard by from whence Christian came. This man, then, meeting with Christian, and having heard about him, for Christian's setting forth from the city of destruction was much noised abroad, not only in the town where he dwelt, but also it began to be the town talk in some other places. Mr. Worldly Wiseman, therefore, having some guess of him, by beholding his laborious going, by noticing his sighs and groans and the like, began thus to enter into some talk with Christian. "'How now, good fellow! Whither away after this burdened manner?' A burdened manner, indeed, as ever I think poor creature had, and whereas you ask me whither away, I tell you, sir, I am going to yonder wicked gate before me, for there, as I am informed, I shall be put into a way to be rid of my heavy burden. Hast thou a wife and a children? Yes, but I am so laden with this burden that I cannot take that pleasure in them as formerly, methinks I am as if I had none. Wilt thou hearken to me, if I give thee counsel? If it be good, I will, for I stand in need of good counsel. I would advise thee, then, that thou with all speed get thyself rid of thy burden, for thou wilt never be settled in thy mind till then, nor canst thou enjoy the blessings which God hath bestowed upon thee till then. That is that which I seek for, even to be rid of this heavy burden, but get it off myself I cannot, nor is there any man in our country that can take it off my shoulders. Therefore am I going this way, as I told you, that I may be rid of my burden. Who bid thee go this way to be rid of thy burden? A man that appeared to me to be a very great and honourable person, his name, as I remember, is Evangelist. I curse him for his counsel. There is not a more dangerous and troublesome way in the world than is that into which he hath directed thee, and that thou shalt find if thou wilt be ruled by his advice. Thou hast met with something, as I perceive, already, for I see the dirt of the slough of despond is upon thee. But that slough is the beginning of the sorrows that do attend those that go on in that way. Hear me, I am older than thou. Thou art like to meet with, in the way that thou goest, wearisomeness, painfulness, hunger, perils, nakedness, sword, lions, dragons, darkness, and, in a word, death, uh, and what not. These things are certainly true, having been proved by the words of many people. And why should a man so carelessly cast away himself, by giving heed to a stranger? 
why, sir, this burden upon my back is more terrible to me than all these things which you have mentioned? Nay, methinks I care not what I meet with in the way, if so be I can also meet with deliverance from my burden. How camest thou by the burden at first? By reading this book in my hand. I thought so. And it has happened unto thee as to unto other weak men, who, meddling with things too high for them, do suddenly fall into thy crazy thoughts, which thoughts do not only unman men, as thine I perceive have done thee, but they run them upon desperate efforts to obtain they know not what. I know what I would obtain. It is ease for my heavy burden. But why wilt thou seek for ease this way, seeing so many dangers attend it? Especially since, hadst thou but patience to hear me, I could direct thee to the getting of what thou desirest, without the dangers that thou in this way wilt run thyself into. Yea, and the remedy is at hand. Besides, I will add that, instead of those dangers, thou shalt meet with much safety, friendship, and content. Sir, I pray, open this secret to me. Why, in yonder village, the village is named Morality, there dwells a gentleman whose name is Legality, a very wise man, and a man of a very good name, that has skill to help men off with such burdens as thine is from their shoulders. Yea, to my knowledge, he hath done a great deal of good this way. Ay, and besides, he hath skill to cure those that are somewhat crazed in their wits with their burdens. To him, as I said, thou mayest go, and be helped presently. His house is not quite a mile from this place and if he should not be at home himself he hath a pretty young man as his son whose name is civility that can do it to speak on as well as the old gentleman himself there i say thou mayest be eased of thy burden and if thou art not minded to go back to thy former habitation as indeed i would not wish thee thou mayest send for thy wife and children to thee in this village where there are houses now standing empty one of which thou mayest have at a reasonable rate provision is there also cheap and good and that which will make thy life the more happy is to be sure there thou shalt live by honest neighbours in credit and good fashion now was christian somewhat at a stand but presently he concluded if this be true which this gentleman hath said, my wisest course is to take his advice. And with that he thus further spake. Sir, which is my way to this honest man's house? Do you see yonder high hill? Yes, very well. By that hill you must go, and the first house you come at is his. So Christian turned out of his way to go to Mr. Legality's house for help. But behold, when he was got now hard by the hill, it seemed so high, and also that side of it that was next to the wayside did hang so much over, that Christian was afraid to venture farther, lest the hill should fall on his head. Wherefore there he stood still, and knew not what to do. Also his burden now seemed heavier to him than while he was in his way. There came also flashes of fire out of the hill, that made Christian afraid that he should be burnt. Here, therefore, he sweat, and did quake for fear. And now he began to be sorry that he had taken Mr. Worldly Wiseman's counsel. And with that he saw Evangelist coming to meet him, at the sight also of whom he began to blush for shame. So Evangelist drew nearer and nearer, and coming up to him, he looked upon him with a severe and dreadful countenance, and thus began to reason with Christian. "'What dost thou hear, Christian?' said he, at which words Christian knew not what to answer, wherefore at present he stood speechless before him. Then said Evangelist further, "'Art thou not the man that I found crying without the walls of the city of destruction?' "'Yes, dear sir, I am the man.' "'Did not I direct thee the way to the little wicked gate?' 
Yes, dear sir, said Christian. How is it then that thou art so quickly turned aside, for thou art now out of the way? I met with a gentleman as soon as I had got over the slough of despond, who persuaded me that I might, in the village before me, find a man that could take off my burden. What was he? He looked like a gentleman, and he talked much to me, and got me at last to yield. So I came hither, but when I beheld this hill and how it hangs over the way, I suddenly made a stand, lest it should fall on my head. What said that gentleman to you? Why, he asked me whither I was going, and I told him. And what said he then? He asked me if I had a family, and I told him. But, said I, I am so laden with the burden that is on my back, that I cannot take pleasure in them as formerly. And what said he then? He bid me with speed get rid of my burden, and I told him it was ease that I sought. And, said I, I am therefore going to yonder gate to receive further direction how I may get to the place of deliverance. So he said that he would show me a better way and short, not so hard as the way, sir, that you sent me in. Which way, said he, will direct you to a gentleman's house that hath skill to take off these burdens? So I believed him, and turned out of that way into this, if haply I might soon be eased of my burden. But when I came to this place, and beheld things as they are, I stopped for fear, as I said, of danger. But I know now not what to do. Then, said Evangelist, Stand still a little, that I may show thee the words of God. So he stood trembling. Then, said Evangelist, God says in his book, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. He said, moreover, Now the righteous man shall live by faith in God. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. He also did thus apply them, Thou art the man that art running into misery. Thou hast begun to reject the counsel of the Most High, and to draw back thy foot from the way of peace, even almost to the danger of thy everlasting ruin. Then the Christian fell down at his feet as dead, crying, Woe is me, for I am undone! At the sight of which Evangelist caught him by the right hand, saying, All manner of sin and evil words shall be forgiven unto man. Be not faithless, but believe in. Then did Christian again a little revive, and stood up trembling, as at first before Evangelist. Then Evangelist proceeded, saying, Give more earnest heed to the things that I shall tell thee of. I will now show thee who it was that led thee astray, and who it was also to whom he sent thee. That man that met thee is one worldly wise man and rightly he is so called, partly because he seeks only for the things of this world. Therefore he always goes to the town of morality, to church, and partly because he loveth that way best, for it saveth him from the cross, and because he is of this evil temper, therefore he seeketh to turn you from my way, though it is the right way. He to whom thou wast sent for ease, being by name, legality is not able to set thee free from thy burden no man was as yet ever rid of his burden by him no nope, nor ever is like to be ye cannot be set right by any such plan therefore mr worldly wise man is an enemy and mr legality is a cheat and for his son civility notwithstanding his simpering looks he is but a fraud and cannot help thee Believe me, there is nothing in all this noise that thou hast heard of these wicked men, but a design to rob thee of thy salvation by turning thee from the way in which I had set thee. After this, Evangelist called aloud to the heavens for proof of what he had said, and with that there came words and fire out of the mountain under which poor Christian stood, which made the hair of his flesh stand up. The words were thus spoken, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now Christian looked for nothing but death, and began to cry out lamentably, even cursing the time in which he met with Mr. Worldly Wiseman. 
still calling himself a thousand fools for listening to his counsel. He also was greatly ashamed to think that this gentleman's arguments should have the power with him so far as to cause him to forsake the right way. This done, he spoke again to Evangelist, in words and sense, as follows. Sir, what think you? Is there any hope? May I now go back and go up to the wicket-gate? Shall I not be abandoned for this and sent back from thence ashamed? I am sorry I have hearkened to this man's counsel, but may my sins be forgiven? Then said Evangelist to him, Thy sin is very great, for by it thou hast committed two evils. Thou hast forsaken the way that is good, to tread in forbidden paths. Yet will the man at the gate receive thee, for he has good will for men only, said he. Take heed that thou not turn aside again, lest thou perish from the way, when his anger is kindled but a little. End of Part 1, Chapter 1